This is Chapter 3, Control Volume Analysis, Part 9. In this video, I'm going to continue talking about applications of the Bernoulli equation. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about the application to Venturi flow meters. A Venturi flow meter uses the conversion of pressure energy into kinetic energy, and that conversion causes a change in the static pressure in the flow, and this static pressure can be used as an indicator in order to measure uh, volume flow rate. After I've talked about Venturi meters, I'll do a numerical example demonstrating how you can uh, measure the volume flow rate in a pipe using a Venturi meter. And I'll end by talking about other flow meters that use the general Bernoulli principle to measure volume flow rates, and these are widely used in industry as well. They're called nozzle flow meters and orifice plate flow meters. Okay, let's start with the Venturi flow meter. A Venturi flow meter is an instrument that you can insert in a pipe, and it consists of a transition section. The flow is contracted and then followed by a smooth expansion, as shown in the picture below. And so what we can do is we can write Bernoulli's equation for two points on a streamline on the center line of the pipe in the, the contraction zone here. So point one is upstream of the, of the contraction and point two is right at the narrowest point. And so we have the kinetic energy term and the pressure term at one and the kinetic energy term and the pressure term at two and these of course must equal a constant because we're on a streamline and so what happens here is because of continuity because of conservation of mass when you reduce the diameter of the pipe the velocity increases so the I don't think you'll have much trouble understanding that the velocity at two is greater than the velocity at one so what happens here is that the kinetic energy in the flow goes up and since the kinetic energy plus the the pressure energy of the flow work must equal a constant the pressure has to decrease so the pressure at two is actually lower than the pressure at one and it's this differential pressure between points one and point two that we can use to measure the volume flow rate and you'll notice here in the diagrams that there are static pressure taps for making those pressure measurements. Now it might seem in sort of counterintuitive that the pressure at two is, is lower than the pressure at one, but I assure you that's the case. And in fact, the pressure can get so low in the throat, right at the narrowest point, that it can cause local boiling. This is a picture of water flowing through a, a venturi. And the velocity has been increased to the point where the pressure at the throat is less than the saturation uh, pressure. So we're getting cavitation because P2, or the pressure at the throat, is less than the, the pressure needed to boil the water at that temperature. Now venturi flow meters are used in industry for measuring volume flow rates for a wide range of applications. They're used in the oil and gas industry, oil refineries, water treatment plants, and as you can see from the photo below here, they can be used for very large pipelines. And the big advantage of a Venturi flow meter over other types of flow meters that I'm going to discuss later in this talk is that they have a very flow sorry, very smooth flow transition. And that smooth flow transition results in very low uh, losses, low turbulence. And this gives very low pressure drops across the venturi meter. And that results in lower pumping power. If you have a lot of turbulence and a lot of pressure loss, you, it, you have, it's gonna cost you more to pump the fluid through the pipe. And so using a venturi flow meter, uh, saves you money in the long run, even though it's more complex than the other devices that I'm going to talk about at the end of this talk. This is a numerical example of using a Venturi flow meter to solve for the fluid flow in a pipe. The problem states the flow rate of fuel oil, which has a specific weight of 9100 newtons per cubic meter is measured using a venturi flow meter at an oil refinery. The main pipe has an inside diameter of 31 millimeters. 
and at the throat of the meter the diameter is 19 millimeters. Using the pressure shown on the sketch, calculate the volume flow rate of oil. So we start this kind of problem always by imagining a streamline. So a streamline at, at point one, going and the flow going to point two. And we're going to assume a frictionless flow so we can use Bernoulli's equation. And so we're going to write the Bernoulli equation at point one and point two. So Bernoulli equation So there's Bernoulli equation written at point one and point two. Now we're not told in the problem, but you're not it's not indicated that there is any elevation change. So we can assume this is a horizontal pipe. So Z1 equals Z2. If the pipe was inclined, of course we could have different values for Z1 and Z2. But you'd have to be given that. So we can cancel the potential energy terms. So I'm going to call that equation one. So now I'm going to use continuity, the conservation of mass, to express the relationship between the velocity at 1 and the velocity at 2. And so because we have a, a liquid, I'm going to assume that the flow is incompressible because we have a liquid. So V1 A1 equals V2 A2. So in other words, I'm making the assumption that density is a constant. We have a liquid, which is oil, so that's a reasonable approximation. So V1 then equals A2 over A1 times V2. And we know that the cross-sectional areas of the pipe here, the cross-sections are going to be proportional to the diameter squared, right? Pi d squared upon 4, so this will become d2 squared, d1 squared, v2. So I'm going to call that equation 2. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the substitution of equation 2 into 1 so that I get Bernoulli's equation just in terms of one velocity. Then I can solve for the velocity because I know the pressure drop uh, from 1 to 2. So I'm making that substitution in here right there. Notice it's squared. So we're going to get P1 upon rho plus now V1 squared. That's going to become D2 upon D1 to the fourth power now. And then V2 squared the potential energy term goes away, so we have P2 upon rho plus V2 squared upon 2. Now what I'm going to do is simplify this. I'm going to start solving for V2 squared. That's the velocity at the throat. So let me scroll down a little bit here. So I'm going to write, rewrite this equation as V2 squared upon 2. I'm going to collect terms. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have 1 minus D2 upon D1 to the fourth power. Basically, you know, I brought this term over to that side. And that's going to equal, and then I'm going to bring this term over to bring the pressure term over. And that's going to give me P1 minus P2 upon rho. Let me just look at that for a moment and make sure I'm happy with that. Yes, I am. OK, so now we can solve for, for V2. So V2 then is going to equal 2 P1 minus P2 over rho. 
and then that whole thing is going to be over 1 minus the area ratio, area ratio d2 upon d1 to the fourth power, all under a square root sign. So now, and I again, I keep emphasizing this, when you're doing uh, the questions on the exam, keep things in symbolic form as long as you can so I can see your, your thought process. So now, uh, all we got to do, we know the pressures, we know uh, P1, we know P2, we know the diameters D2 and D1, we need to get the density, but we're given that the uh, specific weight of the fluid right so we can take uh, we can get the density from the specific weight divided by gravity and that's 9100 91, newtons per cubic meter divided by 9.81 meters per second and as i always do I always do this little check kilogram meter per second squared and you're going to see that uh, Oh, that should be 9.81 meters per second squared. So the meters per second squared go, and you're going to end up with kilograms per cubic meter, which is what you want. And that's 927.6 kilograms per cubic meter. That's the density of our oil that's flowing through the pipe. So let me scroll a little bit more, and I'm going to make the, the final substitutions and get V2, and then I'll multiply V2 by the area to get the flow rate. And it's as simple as that. So V2 then is going to equal 2 times the pressure difference. And you're told that at P1 it's 735 kilopascals minus 550, of course, times 10 to the third newtons per square meter. Now let me just scroll back up just to make sure those numbers. 735 and 550. Yes, certainly. There's P1 is 735. P2 is 550 kilopascals. And now you can see the diameters here that we're going to use in a moment. The diameter at 1 is 31 millimeters, and the diameter at 2 is 19 millimeters. So we'll remember those numbers as well. So scrolling back down. So now we have our two. P1 minus P2, and don't forget the times 10, divided by the density of the oil, 927.6 kilograms per cubic meter. And then we have this odd little term, 1 minus the area ratio, or sorry, the diameter ratio, and we can just put that as 19 over 31 all raised to the fourth power. And then this whole thing is under the square root. And when I calculated that, I got 464. And of course, the units, if you check it out, are meters squared per second squared, square rooted. And you get 21.6 meters per second. So now we're almost there. We've got the, the flow rate. That's the flow rate right at right at the narrowest point, right? Where the diameter is 19 millimeters. So uh, we can calculate the volume flow rate. Q equals V2A2, which equals 21.6 meters per second, and then we have pi, and now we have to put 0 0.019 meters squared divided by 4. That's the area at 2, and uh, you'll see you get cubic meters when you check the units there, cubic meters per second, and I got 0 0.00611 cubic meters per second. Again, I'll open up another page here and scroll up so the you get q equals now remember there's a thousand liters in a cubic meter so if you move the decimal place over three you get 6.11 liters per second which is the 
the answer if you wanted eight liters per second. I just find that more uh, intuitive. It, I, I can imagine what a liter, six liters per second is compared to 0 0.00611 meter, cubic meters per second. Now, of course, this assumes ideal flow. We're using Bernoulli's equation. In reality, you should look up for the Venturi meter. If you buy one in the market, it'll come with a chart that gives a correction factor. It's called a discharge coefficient. Usually it's given the symbol CD and it's a number slightly less than one and you multiply the mass flow rate, the ideal mass flow rate, by this value of CD which is just slightly less than one to get the actual flow rate. And the reason for that of course is because real fluids have viscosity and CD, this discharge coefficient, is a function of the Reynolds number. Well, the, we'll talk more about the Reynolds number as we go along. So that's the solution for, for, for now, as we'll assume ideal flow. If you were doing this in a real world application, you would look up what the discharge coefficient is and make a small correction for it. But we're not going to do that in this problem. And that completes this problem. I should mention that there are other types of meters that use the Bernoulli principle to measure flow. One is a nozzle flow meter and like a venturi meter, it reduces the cross section of the flow, but unlike the venturi meter, it doesn't it doesn't have a clean expansion. It just has a nozzle. And it measures the flow rate, or the flow rate is measured by measuring the differential pressure by between the upstream where the flow is not uh, accelerated and the the contracted zone where the flow is accelerated and the pressure is dropped. And that We'll show later that the flow rate is actually proportional, uh, or sorry, the pressure drop between 1 and 2 is actually proportional to the square of the flow rate. Now, unlike a uh, Venturi meter, uh, it doesn't have this nice slow expansion zone, so you're going to have a lot more turbulence in this zone, and it's going to have more pressure drop because of the downstream turbulence. So it's going to be more uh, pumping power associated with this kind of flow meter. But it's a lot easier to install. As you can see in, uh, and, and really a simpler to design, as you can see in the picture over on this side, you can install it between the flanges of a pipe very easily. So it's a more simple kind of flow meter. A more simple approach is to use an orifice plate flow meter. And this is another differential pressure flow meter where you measure the pressure drop upstream of the pipe and in a contracted flow region. And in this case, what you do is you just insert a plate with a beveled hole between the flanges of a, of a pipe. And then you measure the, the pressure upstream and the pressure at the location where the flow is the narrowest. Now, as you might imagine, there's a lot, going to be a lot of turbulence downstream of this kind of flow meter. And so there's going to be even more pressure drop than a nozzle flow meter and far more pressure drop than in a venturi meter. But as you can imagine, it's very easy to manufacture and install. It's just a plate with a beveled hole that's inserted into a pipe between the flanges. Now, there's a little discussion in this diagram here, a little indication of something called the vena contracta. That's roughly the point where you make the, the pressure measurement P2. The flow that passes through the hole, that doesn't represent the highest velocity. The flow continues to accelerate for a short distance downstream of the hole and the narrowest point occurs uh, just a small distance downstream from the hole and that's referred to in uh, fluid mechanics as the vena contracta. It's Latin for contracted vein. So these are a few ways of using uh, Bernoulli principle to measure volume flow rate and they're widely used in industrial practice.